Note that the casting unit starts operating automatically as each matrix line is delivered. It takes from 5 to 10 seconds for a complete cycle, depending upon the speed of assembly. All the while, the operator continues to compose. Let's go into the explanation of this group. A one-half horsepower motor supplies the drive transmitted by a large pulley through a transmission gear and belt. Many of the basic mechanical actions of the machine depend on the ten large eccentric cams situated at the rear. With a series of springs, they make up a completely automatic setup. These eccentric cams are synchronized to rotate together since they are all mounted on the same shaft. The cams begin to rotate as soon as the delivery slide carries the matrix line into the first elevator jaw. This releases a stop in the delivery cam at the rear of the machine. The two friction shoes of the driving clutch are then pressed against the inside of the driving pulley, thus causing the driving shaft to rotate the cams. At the opposite end, this shaft has a pinion that transmits the movement to the large driving gear on the cam shaft. The cams are thus made to rotate. Every complete turn of the cam shaft corresponds to the casting of a slug. Every eccentric cam has a specific function which it carries on during its cycle quite independently of the others. To get an idea of how the cams work, let's observe the first of the series that controls the first elevator. The first cam, by means of the vertical lever, on a pivotal mount, and the long horizontal lever, which runs through the base of the machine, transmits the movement of the first elevator. Every turn of the cam corresponds to a determined movement of the elevator, as we see in the close-up combination. The cam makes the elevator descend to the vice cap and holds it in casting position. The cam next raises the first elevator to the intermediate channel for the transfer of the mass. Then the cam permits the elevator to return to normal position. Here are the other parts which, with the cams, make up the casting. The vice frame, the mold disc, and the metal pot. This is made of an outside casing or jacket and provides thermoelectric insulation to the crucible that contains the molten type metal. Between the casing and the crucible, there is a cavity stuffed with asbestos. The plunger is in the well of the crucible at the front of which there is a mouthpiece. When the plunger descends, it drives molten metal into the mold against the matrix line, thus casting a slug with the letters in relief. The type metal solidifies almost instantly. Then the plunger rises again to normal position and sucks molten metal into the well to replace what was used up in the previous casting. Automatic feeding regulates the descent of the metal pig to maintain a constant level of the molten metal in the pot. This metal is a triple alloy composed of lead, 85%, antimony, 11%, tin, 4%. The temperature for casting, approximately 285 degrees centigrade, is kept constant by thermostat. The metal pot is always kept heated so that it is ready to cast slugs each time the mouthpiece moves forward and locks against the back of the mold. The mold is mounted on a rotating disc. The disc has teeth which are geared to a pinion activated by two sections of gears so that it rotates at intervals. Normally, the wheel carries four molds for casting. The mold is made up of the following parts. The body, 
fastened to the disc with four screws. The cap. Between the body and the cap there are inserted, depending upon the production needs, the precision liners. Constant length at the right and variable length at the left. The liners determine the length and the thickness of the slug. Therefore, the purpose of the mold, as the word shows, is to establish the dimensions of the lead slug, which may vary in length and in thickness. To avoid constantly changing the liners, there are usually four molds mounted on the disc. Naturally, only one of these is pre-selected for a given job and must be in vertical position at the right. Behind this mold is situated the ejector whose function it is to expel the slug at the right moment. To avoid overheating of the mold in certain models, water is made to circulate on the inside of the disc, as we can see in this diagram, while in others, the same effect is obtained by air blower. In front of the mold disc, there is the vice frame that can be opened when necessary. Important parts of the vise are the first elevator, the vise jaws, the justification block, the knife block, and knives. The first elevator jaw is so arranged as to receive the line of mattresses from the delivery slide and to lower the line between the two vice jaws. The jaw at the right is fixed while the one at the left is movable. The latter, set in advance, determines where the left end of the matrix line will be positioned with respect to the mold opening. The justification block, driving the space band wedges upward, spreads out the line of mattresses. Two vertical knives trim the sides of the slug. One knife is movable and the other stationary. The movable one is adjustable in advance according to the type size called for. After pointing out many parts involved in casting, it will now be easy to review the operations involved in the casting of a new slug. The elevator lowers the matrix line between the vice jaws. In the meantime, the mold disc makes a quarter turn to put the mold in position for casting. It advances slowly to engage the lugs of the mat in the alignment grooves of the mold body. The justification block raises the wedges of the space band, which expand themselves between the words and spread out the line. The metal pot advances against the mold, locking the mouthpiece tightly against the mold and the mat. This is the instance in which the plunger injects the molten type metal into the mold under pressure, casting the slug with the letters in relief. The plunger rises, the pot and the disc retract. The justification block comes down. The mold disc starts its three-quarter turn, during which a knife, located behind the disc, trims the base of the slug, bringing it to exact printing height. Now the ejector blade forces the slug between the two vertical knives, which trim it on both sides. Then it falls into the galley. Immediately after casting, the first elevator carries the line of mats to the second elevator. Now, the casting operations completed, the distribution operation begins. Now, the line of mats is the line with the tooth bar of the second elevator, which has seated on the transfer channel. The transfer finger, moving the mats toward the right, forces them from the first to the second elevator. The mats glide onto the second elevator bar and remain there, suspended by their teeth. As soon as the transfer has been completed, the elevators return immediately to their normal position. The space bands, which do not have teeth, remain in the transfer channel. During the second closing of the transfer levers, the space band pole engages the space bands and returns them to the box. The distributor shifter retracts, allowing the second elevator to seat at the distributor. Then the shifter pushes the mat into the distributor box.
Here the mats are raised, one by one, by the matrix lift. The slight lift is sufficient to insert the mats into the coils of the three helicoidal screws. It should be noted that it is not the function of these screws to keep the mat suspended, but only to push them ahead. The two upper screws engage the ears of the matrix, while the lower one engages the lower front lug. To keep the mat suspended up to the moment of their release into the magazine is the function of the distributor on which they glide suspended by their combination teeth. Every mat is therefore supported on the distributor bar by means of their teeth, as we can see here. For example, the mat of the letter O will remain suspended on the bar with the second and third tooth combination. This other one, however, corresponding to the letter N, will remain suspended with a fourth tooth combination. When the distributor bar fails to supply the required combination, the mat, no longer having support, drops into the magazine. Therefore, for the 90 magazine channels, there are 90 different tooth combinations, and consequently, an equal number of combinations along the length of the distributor bar. The mats, detaching themselves from the bar, return to their respective channels in the magazine. Those mats which do not run in the magazine have all of their teeth so that they run the entire length of the distributor and drop into a chute which guides them into a stacker near the keyboard where the operator can select them and insert them as needed in the assembling elevator. Let's now review the entire procedure at a glance. The manipulation of the keys releases the mats from in the magazine. They drop between the assembler entrance partition and are delivered to assembling elevator to form the line. The finished line is sent on to the caster. The mold and the metal pot advance and the plunger makes the cast. The pot and the mold withdraw. Then the first elevator rises to transfer the mat to the second elevator bar. At the same time, the slug, trimmed at the base and sides, is ejected into the galley. The mats go to the distributor. Moved by the helicoidal screws, they run along the length of the distributor bars so that, with the procedure already noted, they fall into the respective channels of the magazine, ready for use in succeeding lines. As in all industries, technical progress has achieved notable progress in mechanical composition. Here's a sensational one. This machine has been made completely automatic so that it is not necessary to have an operator touch the keys. The keys are actuated by a tape perforated in code. This system, known as a teletype setter, is based upon the principles of the teletype used in many newspapers both in Europe and in America. The ribbon is first perforated by a machine with the keyboard almost like that of a typewriter. At every touch of the keys, code perforations are made on the tape, which are aligned vertically and numbered from zero to six. These two perforations correspond to the letter A, the letter B has three perforations. The letter C also has three perforations, but different in position. D has two, E only one. Three perforations for the letter F, and so on, for all the other letters and symbols. The small central perforations serve only to move the ribbon forward. At the same time, the widths of the mats and space bands are total on the scale on the quadrant. When the line is finished, 
The keys are hit for the return of the indicator. Thus perforated, the ribbon is applied to the so-called automatic operator situated at the right of the keyboard of the composing machine. The reading of the perforated tape is accomplished by the automatic operator, a true jewel of engineering, usually six small feelers in series with the perforation. It is interesting to observe how only the small feelers which go through the perforations in the tape transmit the movement to the keys of the composing machine which translates the codes without error at a top speed of 20,000 letters an hour. Note that the raising of the assembling elevator is also automatic. This is the performance of one of the numerous composing machines which, with increasing rhythm, accomplished the important task of preparing composition for newspapers, periodicals, books, and printing of all kinds in all European languages and in some Oriental ones as well.